when I was studying um, fructose in animals, I was showing that they induce insulin resistance in the, systemically and that they induce mitochondrial dysfunction, reduce the ATP levels and suppress the mitochondria and they cause inflammation. I go, wait, this is the same biosignature as what's going on in the brain. Could it be true that fructose could be doing this? And what's very interesting is that if you eat fructose uh, or sugar, uh, most of it is removed in the liver and only a tiny bit gets to the brain. So it seemed like there was some paradox. There was some problem. Why is it that very little fructose gets to the brain if, if fructose is driving the disease in the brain? I am delighted to be here. My name is Rob Lustig. I am a pediatric endocrinologist at the University of California, San Francisco. And I have been waiting for this for months now. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Rick Johnson, uh, is going to introduce himself, but he is the head of adult nephrology at the University of Colorado in Denver, Boulder, I should say. Rob, you're, uh, you, you are more than just a doctor. You are a leader in the field of fructose, and uh, I'm so happy to be on the show with you. Um, but anyway, I'm Rick Johnson. I'm a nephrologist here at the University of Colorado, as you said, and no longer the division chief, but I'm uh, very active in research and doing all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> I would say all kinds of things. Um, you know, one of the things that I want to ask you, Rick, uh, is you are a nephrologist. You are a kidney doctor. How did you get so far afield to basically study carbohydrates and specifically sugar, what captivated you about this topic? Well, I tend to go far afield in, in my work. I, I basically follow my nose and follow where, where my research takes me. And, um, and so I was trying to understand the role of uric acid and hypertension. Uh, and it's known that the kidney has a really important role in hypertension. Uh, in regulating salt excretion. And so I was studying uric acid and we had this kind of amazing surprise because uh, uric acid is associated with hypertension, but no one really thought it might have a, a causal role in hypertension. But when we raised uric acid in, in rats, they became hypertensive. I go, what? How can that be? How can just raising the uric acid in a rat cause high blood pressure. It can't be. And I, so we did like a hundred animals and it was like true. And, um, and so that launched me in a new direction, which was uh, uric acid as a potential mediator of kidney and disease and high blood pressure. And, uh, and then as we started studying it more, we said, Hey, what's, why are so many, do so many people have a high uric acid in our population? Um, and, uh, and so one of the things that can do it is sugar and particularly the fructose component. I know you've yourself were studying this, uh, in parallel with me. And, uh, and so what we did then was, uh, we gave, uh, sugar and we also gave fructose to animals and their uric acid went up and their blood pressure went up. And it seemed like sugar might be a cause of high blood pressure. And then I go, wow. But what I was really surprising was that they, maybe not so surprising, but the animals got fat and they got, uh, you know, metabolic syndrome. They got fatty liver and they got all these different things. And, uh, and so we lowered the uric acid with a drug to see if we could have an effect on the blood pressure. And the blood pressure came down, but Taka, my, the guy working with me, comes into my office and says, hey, Rick not only did we block high blood pressure, but they're less fat. They, they have less fat in their liver. They have less fat in their blood. They are less insulin resistant. And then we go, uh-oh, could uric acid be involved in much more than just blood pressure and kidney disease? Could it have a role in how sugar may cause metabolic syndrome? And that, because it's the fructose that raised the uric acid, uh, suddenly I was studying fructose. So a kidney doctor transforms into studying metabolism. And that took me into the world of endocrinology and obesity and into discovering you, Robert. <laughs> 
You know, we all come at this, you know, from completely different ways. Uh, you know, my my origin story in this is, you know, completely, complete, totally different. You know, I was taking care of kids with brain tumors at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And I had a stable, a cadre of about 40 kids who had survived their brain tumor to become massively obese. Now, this form of obesity was well known in the literature, but no one knew what caused it called hypothalamic obesity due to hypothalamic damage because the hypothalamus is the, you know, as you know, the hormonal regulatory center of pretty much the entire body and also of weight. And that hormone, that pesky hormone leptin had just been discovered in 1994. I moved to St. Jude in 1995. And, you know, I said, well, you know, let's measure their leptin levels. Well, their leptin levels were sky high because after all, they were obese. So obviously it wasn't because they were leptin deficient, which of course is not surprising, but they were clearly leptin resistant. And the question is, why were they leptin resistant? Well, I was aware from my neuroendocrine training that you could lesion the ventroneveal hypothalamus in a rat with a, you know, with a, with an electrode and they would become massively obese. And not only that, you could block that effect by cutting the vagus nerve. So the th thought was, well, they can't see their leptin because of the brain tumor. Their brain senses starvation because they can't see their leptin. They're sending a message to the pancreas to release insulin via the vagus nerve, and that that insulin is driving the weight gain. That was the first aha. And so I can't cut a vagus nerve because I'm not a surgeon, but is there anything else I could do? Well, we had a drug available to us that could suppress insulin called octreotide. And so we gave octreotide to these kids in a pilot trial and lo and behold, they started losing weight. But not only did they start losing weight, they started being more physically active. This was really remarkable. You know, this was, you know, uh, a, a, an untoward effect that was very positive. And the parents would say, I got my kid back. And the kids would say, this is the first time my head hasn't been in the clouds since the tumor. I mean, these were kids who sat on the couch, ate Doritos and slept. And now all of a sudden they're right running around, you know, with basketballs and, you know, trying to swim and, you know, this was really remarkable. So we did a double blind placebo control trial and built a quality of life and activity questionnaire into that one. And sure enough, same thing happened. So this taught me that the behaviors that we associate with obesity, gluttony and sloth are biochemically driven. And one of the major drivers of it is this hormone insulin. So that, of course, has nothing to do with fructose. <laughs> but what it did say to me was, all right, these kids are very rare, but we know what's going on with them. What's going on with everybody else? And why does everybody else have a high insulin when they don't have a brain tumor? And that's where fructose came in. So I was giving a talk at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences at their 100th anniversary. Uh, uh, they, and it was a two-day symposium. The first day was going to be on uh, successes, so lead poisoning and pollution and asthma. And the second day was going to be on new challenges. So the morning was obesity and metabolic syndrome, and the afternoon was ADD and autism. Okay. So they asked me to come to this meeting at NIH and tell them what I thought was the biggest environmental factor involved in obesity and metabolic syndrome. And I figure they probably thought I was going to come talk about, you know, bisphenol A or PFAS or, you know, PBDE, you know, flame, a flame retardant or, you know, phthalates, you know, plasticizers, you know, something in the environment we could remove easily. And I thought, you know, that just isn't it. <laughs> just isn't. I said, all right, I'm a pediatrician. What are the two diseases that children get today that they never got before? You know, because children are always the canaries in the coal mine for everything. 
including, by the way, Alzheimer's. And we'll get there in a minute. Um, the two diseases were type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease. When I started medical school, you know, that was unheard of in children. It was even unheard of in adults unless you were an alcoholic. And so then I said, well, all right, let fatty liver disease and type 2 diabetes. I opened up my uh, Leninger, my uh, biochemistry text from 1974 from college. And I said, all right, these were the diseases of alcohol. So I turned to the alcohol page and then I turned the page and there was fructose. And I started looking at the pathways and I looked at the pathways and I went, wait a second. They're exactly the same. There's no difference. And then I said, well, yeah, well, of course that makes sense because after all, where do you get alcohol from? Fermentation of fructose. It's called wine. So I went to this meeting at the NIH and I said, I think fructose is the driver. I think that it is the environmental obesogen, which is now a real term, um, that is driving this obesity metabolic syndrome epidemic, particularly in children. And I gave my talk. And then as soon as my talk was over, it was the uh, you know coffee break, bathroom break, and nobody came back into the room. And so I had to use the bathroom. So I went out to the bathroom and they tackled me. There's a bunch of toxicologists tackled me in the friggin' bathroom, <laughs> screaming at me saying, oh my God, oh my God, he's right. Fructose is a toxin. You have to tell the world about this. I got to tell you, I have never been tackled by a bunch of toxicologists before. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic story. Yeah. So, you know, uh, when we found that we could lower uric acid and improve this fructose, um, we, we realized that we were dealing with something that was working independently of calories because lowering uric acid was not affecting, um, you know, isn't part of the caloric pathway of fructose. It's, it's involved in, in this side chain reaction of fructose metabolism. So fructose gets metabolized like a calorie, but when uh, the uric acid is generated from fructose, it's generated because the ATP levels fall on the cell and the ATP turnover leads to the uric acid. So just like you were thinking it was a toxin, um, you know, we, I, I thought, oh my gosh, this suggests that fructose is causing metabolic syndrome through a pathway that does not involve calories. And so, uh, and, but, but it was true that these animals were eating more and when we measured it, we found just like you did that leptin levels were high, but they weren't responding to leptin. So if we injected leptin in the rats, they kept eating. Normally, if you inject leptin, animals will quit eating. And so we also realized that obesity, most people with obesity have leptin resistance as well. So we went on and, try and showed that the fructose actually induced leptin resistance in the brain, but high fat diet alone did not. It was specific to fructose. And so that was kind of a big breakthrough where we go, oh my gosh, fructose makes animals eat more. And that is one of the reasons you gain weight. But uh, if we pair fed them so that the, they couldn't eat more, uh, they still gained a little weight because of the block and resting energy metabolism. But um, uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, they, they really didn't gain much weight, but they still developed diabetes. They still developed fatty liver. They still developed increased, you know, visceral fat. So, so it was working, fructose is working independently of calories, but also is driving calorie intake. And, and so we, we, you and I converged, uh, with the concept of the leptin resistance being, being involved and, um, and that and that insulin levels go up, uh, so that's very very interesting. Yeah, we keep converging throughout. Well, you know, I mean, we're we're both on the same track, and uh, you know, have <clears throat> benefited from each other's work. Um, you know, we've never published together, but I think we have to fix that, Rick. I really do. Yeah, let's fix that. I would love to to publish with you. Yeah. So, um, you know, the thing obviously that got levels excited and you know the reason why we're doing this podcast right now is because of the paper that you published with David Perlmutter and Dale Bredesen on 
uh, fructose and Alzheimer's. Now, I got to tell you, this is something that has been stuck in my head. It's been a bee in my bonnet for years. And when I say years, I mean years. Um, and I didn't have a you know way in per se, but I actually have talked to several people about it, including Dale. And I've also talked to Stan Prusner, the Nobel Prize winner, you know, who discovered prions uh, about this. And so I have my own pet theory about why this is uh, and why sugar might be uh, a root, not the only, but a root cause of Alzheimer's disease. So since you are an author of the paper, in fact, first author of the paper, why don't you um, give the audience sort of the, shall we say, you know, the, the, the too, uh, uh, too long, didn't read, you know, version of, you know, why fructose might be a bad guy in your brain. Yes. So, so first off, so uh, most people, when they think about Alzheimer's disease, they think about the fact that this is a terrible, terrible disease uh, that leads to atrophy of the brain and the building up of amyloid plaques in the brain and also a thing called tau protein aggregation. So that, you know, so for the last uh, 50 years, you know, Alzheimer's disease has really been thought to be uh, due to these amyloid plaques. And so there's been this huge movement to try to um, find out what's causing the amyloid plaques and how we can reverse it. And their uh, pharmaceutical agency or companies have generated all these different ways to try to block the amyloid plaques. And as you know, um, it's, it's weak. Uh, the, the data shows maybe a little bit of improvement here and there, but it's nothing like what we were hoping for. Yeah, but I'm now really concerned because of this whole scandal <clears throat> that, you know, uh, science and nature have, uh, you know, uncovered that there's actually been some doctoring of some photos back from the 2002 uh, paper that originally identified amyloid as the problem. And so maybe amyloid's not really the problem. I've also heard that amyloid might be the body's defense against the problem as opposed to the problem itself, just because amyloid shows up on the scene doesn't mean it's the cause. Just because something's there doesn't mean, you know, it's the, uh, it's the causation. It might be the innocent bystander. Right. So, uh, but anyway, I think that the movement has been that the amyloid plaques can't be the primary cause. There must be something underneath. And, uh, you know, so there's been a lot of interest in the last 10 years on three key findings that people see early in Alzheimer's. And the first finding is that there uh, tends to be insulin resistance in the brain. And, uh, you know, a lot of the brain doesn't need insulin. There's, uh, it will take up glucose independently of insulin, some areas of the brain, but there are certain regions that are insulin dependent. And uh, you can show uh, in animal models as well as in humans, uh, that that there's an, a, a degree of insulin resistance, and there are even people giving intranasal insulin as a potential way to try to help treat that with you know some possible benefit. But you know it'd be much better to know the cause of the insulin resistance in the brain than just to give insulin. We should mention that we now know that there are specific trophic factors in the brain. You know, people often think of the brain as fixed. You know, it grows and then, you know, those um, synapses are fixed and, you know, there's no uh, regeneration, there's no remodeling, you know, it's, you know, a, a, a static structure. And I will tell you, uh, my very first project in science back in 1984 showed that estrogen, okay, a, a different trophic factor remodeled synapses in the hypothalamus. You know, this was, you know, unheard of. And I got a lot of flack for it at the time. And now we, you know, it's common knowledge. But, you know, the idea that the brain is plastic and that things can change what's going on in the brain. And there are trophic factors. And the ones that are most relevant to this story are insulin and leptin and also brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And they are altering 
synaptogenesis. And when they're not working, you know, synapses can fall out. Well, guess what? That's Alzheimer's. So, so the fact that you are insulin resistant in your brain is clearly not a good thing, not just from a metabolic standpoint, but from a neural architecture standpoint. Yeah, exactly. So, and you're exactly right about the BDNF and all these other different growth factors and the plasticity. But anyway, so insulin resistance is one of those factors that you can see early on in Alzheimer's and some people call it brain diabetes or whatever. A second one is that the neurons seem to have some dysfunction of their mitochondria, the, the little energy factories that make ATP and ATP levels fall early there's this mitochondrial dysfunction and there's uh, inflammation. And uh, so these three things, neural inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, and insulin resistance. And, you know, when I was studying um, fructose in, the, in, the, in animals, uh, I was showing that they induce insulin resistance in the, systemically and that they induce mitochondrial dysfunction reduce the ATP levels and suppress the mitochondria and they cause inflammation. I go, wait, this is the same biosignature as what's going on in the brain. Could it be true that fructose uh, could, uh, could be doing this? And what's very interesting is that if you eat fructose uh, or sugar, uh, most of it is removed in the liver and only a tiny bit gets to the brain. So it seemed like there was some paradox. There was some problem. Why is it? that um, very little fructose gets to the brain if, if fructose is driving the disease in the brain, like what I was thinking. And then we had these really cool, not so cool discoveries, Robert, that the body can make fructose and um, that you don't have to necessarily eat fructose. Uh, but when you eat sugar, you, the body makes fructose. So the body makes fructose in response to sugar and that the body makes uh, fructose in response to high glycemic carbs like potatoes and rice. And it also makes it uh, in response to salty foods. And all three pathways in, is due to a particular enzymatic reaction that I call the polyol pathway. But what it is is glucose can be converted to fructose. And so when you eat a lot of high glycemic carbs, uh, the glucose levels go up in the blood that's why CGM is so helpful. That's why levels is so important a group uh, because they, they provide these CGMs. But when the glucose goes up in the blood, fructose starts to be produced in the brain. And this has even been shown by a group at Yale in humans that if you raise blood glucose, fructose levels go up in the brain in humans within in about after about 40 minutes. Uh, and it's very significant. And we found that uh, high glycemic carbs and salty foods, salt actually triggers that reaction of glucose to fructose. So there are these foods that we eat that can generate fructose. And when it goes up, it goes up in the brain as well as in other tissues. So this led me to think, well, perhaps what's going on is uh, we're eating foods that are raising fructose levels in the brain. And then I started looking at it and I realized that there are all these data that show that, you know, sugar intake is a risk factor for Alzheimer's. It's a risk factor for cerebral atrophy. High glycemic carbs are a risk factor. Uh, salty foods are a risk factor. All the things that generate fructose are risk factors for Alzheimer's and obesity and diabetes, which are, you know, sig signatures for fructose production or intake. They are also a risk factor. So uh, then uh, we had this, this connection between the risk factors for Alzheimer's are the same risk factors for raising fructose in the brain. You know what another way to make fructose in the brain? Be pregnant. Yes, yes, absolutely. And also trauma, like uh, trauma is a risk factor for the brain. When the brain is, gets a concussion, there's a, what we call a little bit of ischemia. And the ischemia generates fructose in the brain in response to a concussion. This is an important point for our audience who's listening, okay? Normally, the food industry tells you, oh, fructose is fine. It gets converted to glucose in the liver. That can be true. That's why they put the high fructose corn syrup in the Gatorade. It was because, in fact, the fructose can enter glycogen 
you know, can become glycogen through a backdoor pathway through uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and ultimately be, be diverted away from the mitochondria and toward glycogen. That is actually true if you're glycogen depleted. And so that's the, that ostensibly that's the reason why, um, you know, fructose is in sports drinks. However, and this is, you know, credit to you, glucose can also be converted to fructose. And, you know, it's through this thing called the polyol pathway. And the polyol pathway is not known to everybody. And it's worth a moment, you know, to sort of talk about like why this happens. By the way, the polyol pathway is the reason for cataracts because glucose gets converted to sorbitol, which is a sugar alcohol, and that's an osmolite which holds on to water, and that ultimately is the nidus for cataracts. So this occurs, and occurs in the eye, occurs in the brain, and then that sorbitol gets converted to fructose. So Rick, why do we do this? Why is this a pathway that matters? Why did, is it there? And why didn't we develop a mutation to get rid of that instead of the uricase mutation that you're famous for? Yes. So anyway, so uh, that's a great question. And so when we were looking at this, we were saying, why is it that fructose can do all these things and it's true. If you give fructose to a starving animal, it will be converted to glucose because it wants fuel, immediate fuel. But if you give fructose to a fed animal, it will, uh, it will lower the ATP and activate this process that leads to obesity and metabolic syndrome. And, and it's really interesting that uh, animals will eat fructose to prepare for times when there's no food around. Like the bear will eat fructose in the fall in the berries. It'll eat thousands of berries. It doesn't eat like one natural fruit. It'll eat thousands and it will activate this, this switch and it activates it by dropping the ATP in the mitoc uh, reduces mitochondrial production of ATP. It induces insulin resistance and all these things as a mechanism to aid survival. Well, one of the really cool things that we dis we uh, have kind of discovered or at least have really looked at carefully with others is that fructose stimulates foraging. And so when you, when fructose goes up in the brain, for example, or when you give sugar, you will stimulate a foraging response. And that foraging response turns out to be very important in Alzheimer's because what for the way that you stimulate foraging to forage, you have to go into an area that you've not been, you know, you, I mean, you, you're looking for food. You have to be willing to go into areas where you've not been, search for food, look around. You have to look quickly. You, ha you can't spend a lot of time. You can't deliberate. You ha can't have a lot of self-control. You need to just be able to plunge in and do it, get the food, get out. Got to go into that lion's den, et cetera, et cetera. Sounds like every convenience store I've ever been to. <laughs> exactly. So go in there and forage around. And uh, anyway... <laughs> So it turns out that to do this foraging, you actually have to suppress certain areas of the brain. Like the cortex is really involved in self-control, like this, especially the frontal cortex. And so when you give fructose, you inhibit the activity of that area so that you have less self-control, sort of like alcohol, actually. Uh, likewise, you, you, you'll, if you give fructose, you'll inhibit the area for recent memory because the recent memory is you don't want to really have vivid memories of what's of how dangerous it is, where you're going to go. Right. And, and uh, it will also like stimulate impulsivity and all these things. And the way it does it, it, it works on certain regions of the brain. And guess what? Those are the insulin dependent regions of the brain and uh, certain areas of the brain. It stimulates like the anterior cingulate, for example, is a part of the brain that's important for foraging. And fructose stimulates that, but other areas it inhibits. And then when you look at that, you find this amazing thing. Alzheimer's affects the areas of the brain that are inhibited by fructose. And the areas that are stimulated by fructose are preserved. So like the occipital cortex, so that you can see the food, it's not affected very much in Alzheimer's. The anterior cingulate, which drives the foraging, that's not really affected um, by in Alzheimer's, but 
the cerebral cortex, the hippocampus, the entorhinal cortex, all these different areas that are inhibited by fructose are actually the signature of where, the, where it occurs. And it's the same areas where insulin resistance occurs. So let's talk about that for a minute, because we have we had a hypothesis a long time ago, my colleague, Dr. Alejandro Gugliucci at Toro University and I, um, you know, talked about, you know, why does fructose do this? And, you know, it's in my book, Metabolical, I believe it's even in your book, Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. There's this enzyme that is responsible for how cells and how neurons burn energy. And that enzyme is called AMP kinase. So AMP kinase is basically the signal to your cell that there's not enough energy around. Now, why? Because the um, uh, substrate that uh, contains the energy is this um, molecule called ATP, okay, adenosine triphosphate, and the energy is in the phosphate bonds, as you know but the audience may not. And so when you need energy, you cleave off a phosphate and then that, uh, the, the electrons from that then basically get diverted through the electron transport chain to generate um, true energy. So the ATP is the substrate for energy production. But when your cells run out of energy, they turn the ATP into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates, and then finally AMP, adenosine monophosphate, only one phosphate. So every time a phosphate comes off, energy is released, but it also leads to energy depletion. Like I said, the fuel gauge on the cell. Well, that AMP kinase is the stimulator of new mitochondria. It is the uh, thing that tells the cell, hey, there's not enough energy around here. I need to make more mitochondria in order to be able to make more energy. So it is the signal for mitochondrial um, uh, biogenesis. Well, that AMP kinase is really unique. It, it has three components. It has three subunits, alpha, beta, gamma. And in the gamma subunit is the active site for the AMP, for the adenosine monophosphate, in order for it to turn that enzyme on. Well, there is a, a molecule, an intermediate metabolite of fructose called methylglyoxal. And methylglyoxal, MGO, and lots of people have worked on this, people in um, England and people here at the Buck Institute of Aging, um, that methylglyoxal has an aldehyde on it, and it fits just right into that active site in that gamma subunit. And when it does, that aldehyde binds to an arginine and basically kills the enzyme. It doesn't just inhibit the enzyme, it kills it, irreversibly inhibits it. And so that enzyme is now dead. And so basically what fructose is doing through this metabolite is depleting your ability to generate mitochondria. So your, your, your energy is on its way down and your ability to create new energy is now basically knocked out. And so that this notion of Alzheimer's might be due to a depletion in neuronal energetics. It's exactly it. We're, we have the same hypothesis, Robert. Because uh, when we give fructose to animals, we inhibit AMP kinase, but we do even more than that. So um, what we do is uh, the fructose consumes ATP acutely, but then it generates this oxidative stress that suppresses the mitochondria from making ATP. So the ATP levels can't, don't go up because the mitochondria is not making it. And then the rescue systems, the AMP kinase, but that's inhibited as well. And so what happens is fructose lowers the ATP in the cell through all these pathways, the oxidative stress of the mitochondria, the inhibition of AMP kinase, just as you say. And we actually found that uric acid inhibits AMP kinase as well. And so it drops the energy in the cell. And that is the signal to eat more, to uh, you know, forage. That is the foraging signal. And by the way, one of the earliest signs of Alzheimer's is actually increased food intake and obesity. Yes. Yes, actually. 
So anyway, so what we, you know, to kind of wrap this, our hypothesis together, basically, uh, you know, if you give sugar to animals, which has fructose in it, after about eight weeks, they have trouble walking through a maze. They have, tr you know, normally they can get through a maze and, and as the more times they go through it, the, the faster they go. If you give them fructose, when they, they, they go through the maze, they don't get faster. They, they continue to have trouble getting through the maze. Then if you look in their brains, you find insulin resistance, you find mitochondrial dysfunction, you find a drop in BDNF, your nerve growth factor, you find a, a drop in ATP, mitochondrial dysfunction. It is exactly what we're talking about. And then if you go out to 16 weeks, they actually start developing amyloid plaques and tau protein. So let me go there for a minute. So this is what I talked to Stan Prusner about many years ago, you know, because I, I came to him and I said, could fructose be a driver of Alzheimer's? He said, well, maybe. And he told me why he thought that might be true. He said, so you have this thing called amyloid. All right. It's there. Okay. There, it, it, it's not like you make the amyloid. It's in a different form. Okay. It is in uh, uh, IAPP before it becomes amyloid. It's in intercellular amyloid polypeptide before it becomes amyloid, which is this gunk, you know, that basically, uh, you know, forms the plaque, but it's a, it's a protein before that. Well, that IAPP, before it, you know, becomes gunk, it's an alpha helix, okay? Alpha, just like DNA is an alpha helix, okay? So it's wound around and it is soluble when it is an alpha helix. But in order to maintain that conformation, in order to maintain that alpha helical structure requires energy. That's an energy dependent process. It's one of the things the energy in the neuron is used for is maintaining these proteins in their correct conformation. When the energy in the cell goes down because the mitochondria are dysfunctional because of the AMP kinase and all the things we've just talked about and the, the levels of energy in the cell are going down, those alpha helices in the IAPP can't stay alpha helices anymore because that's an energy dependent process. And so what happens is they go from an alpha helix to beta sheet. And beta sheeting basically is a collapsing of those coils onto themselves. And when that happens, it's kind of like dominoes. They start basically, um, you know, more uh, uh, proteins, you know, come uh, uh, become part of the, uh, the, the, this new, you know, problematic structure, which of course is exactly what happens with prions. This is why Stan Prusner was so, you know, excited about this. So this is something that happens in neurons routinely when there's an energy problem. It looks like you and I are getting to the same place, but we, we took separate roads. We both took roads less traveled by. You and I both got to the same place. A drop in ATP is probably the key issue driving Alzheimer's. And there's only one nutrient. There's only one nutrient that lowers ATP in a cell, and that's fructose. And fructose levels are high in patients with Alzheimer's, five to six-fold higher than in normal uh, age-matched controls. So um, I think that we're, we're you know... Your your idea about inhibition of AMPK, these are fantastic. I wish that I'd written the paper with you, Rob. Not just <laughs> <laughs> would have been a stronger paper. It's quite all right. We 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 can still do it. It's okay. Um, <clears throat> but I do. I think that ATP is sort of the uh, the the linchpin in the story to some extent. However, there's even more. There's even more. It's not like you know, I mean, if it was just one thing, you know, then we could get a drug that it ain't going to happen. And here's, uh, here's why I think it's more than that. I don't know how well you look at the GI literature, Rick, but you, you might've seen this paper that came out a couple of months ago. Now, um, uh, the first author is Ivanov. Okay. And it came from, uh, Elenov's lab in, uh, at the Weizmann in, and, uh, Rehovot, Israel. And what they did was they said, you know, 
Everyone says a high fat diet causes metabolic syndrome, but it also causes Alzheimer's. Okay, it causes all the chronic metabolic diseases. But a ketogenic diet, which is the highest fat diet, doesn't. And so the question is, what's going on at the level of the gut? Because they study the gut. And what they found was that, you know, the gut has three, count them, three separate barriers in it. Because, you know, your gut's a sewer, okay? There's a lot of, <laughs> you know, S-H-I, you know what, in there, okay? The, the, your, gut, your gut's not the cleanest place in the world, okay? Right. Yeah. Um, and you want all that stuff <laughs> to stay in your gut and not end up in your bloodstream, right? <laughs> so there are three barriers in your intestine to keep the junk out. The first is the physical barrier, the mucin layer. The second is the biochemical barrier, the tight junctions, the proteins that bind the cells together, the most famous of which, of course, is zonulins, you know, which is what goes wrong in celiac disease. But there's a third barrier, too, the immunologic barrier. And as you know, there's more immune cells in the gut than anywhere else in the body. And the reason is to keep the junk out. And one of the major cell types that does this is a cell called the Th17 cell. And it makes a protein called IL-17, interleukin-17, very specifically to maintain intestinal integrity. Now, what they did, what Ivanov et al. did, was they exposed animals to a regular diet, a high fat with sugar diet and a ketogenic diet that is a high fat without sugar diet. And what they showed was that the Th17 cells in the IL-17 in the intestine was perfectly fine with the regular diet and it was perfectly fine with the ketogenic diet. But with the high fat diet with a little bit of sugar, in other words, our diet, the cafeteria diet, the standard American diet, the SAD diet, the SAD diet, our diet, okay? The Th17 cells were completely depleted. The IL-17 was low and the junk in the intestine made it across into the bloodstream. Yeah. You know, I, I exactly. The sugar, the, it's the fructose that causes the leaky gut syndrome. And, uh, you know, we, uh, a long time ago, we were giving fructose and we could show that we could disrupt the tight junctions by just giving fructose to a mouse and increasing uh, the gut leak. And I'll tell you a cool story. So, I mean, so it's the same sort of story that you just said, but what we didn't look at the TH17 pathway, IL-17, and that's really important. And uh, that's a major um, paper. But anyway, but I will tell you kind of a fun story. I, um, so I was aware that sugar could cause leaky gut and a leaky gut is really important for allergies, food allergies like peanut allergies and stuff like that. And um, little children are, are, you know, are getting allergies more. They're getting these anaphylactic reactions more. So uh, uh, there was an immunologist who was uh, Steve Dreskin, who was speaking at the university and he he had created a model of anaphylactic shock to peanuts uh, in which he gave peanut antigens to animals in which he disrupted the intestinal barrier by giving them um, uh, uh, toxins, uh, um, not botulinum, but um, uh, diphtheria, not diphtheria, the, uh, cholera toxin, sorry. He, so he would give cholera toxin to make the leaky gut, and then he the peanut antigens would would trigger an anaphylactic episode. And I went up to him afterwards and said, you know, I think I can um, have you do this experiment without giving cholera toxin. Why don't you just give fruit fruit juice, you know, or, or fructose? So we we did some studies together, and when he gave fructose, it caused the cap the gut leak, and then the animals anaphylaxed. And uh, we never actually published the paper because uh, we never had, we needed to do more animals. But, um, but basically, I think that the reason food allergies are, are so prominent in the last few decades is because of this 
sad use of giving ju fruit juice to little toddlers and stuff. Um, but it's this leaky gut. Uh, and, there's, and there's actually data to support that. And, but, you know, there's, it, it may be an effect on the intestinal cell itself, or it may be an effect on the specific microorganisms in the intestine. Example, group A strep. Group A strep. Now, we know, we know that the bacteria that causes tooth decay in your mouth is strep mutans, and it loves fructose. It loves fructose. It has very <laughs> specific enzymes that make that fructose a preferential substrate just for it. And so it's what burns the hole in your tooth because it can metabolize the fructose and none of the other bacteria can. Well, it turns out there are group A strep in your intestine that love fructose just as much. And they create toxins, okay? And strep is famous for creating toxins. After all, what is rheumatic fever? What is pandas? You know, this new, you know, um, uh, progressive or, uh, autoimmune uh, neuropathic, um, uh, you know, disease associated with strep. You know, it was what Sydenham's chorea was, you know, way back when. The point is, all of these end up having neurologic manifestations because of what went on in the gut, because we fed the wrong bacteria the substrate they love. It's amazing how complicated fructose is, but um, how it all leads in excess leads to morbidity. And, um, you know, as we get towards the end of the hour, it's, it's, uh, it's really fun talking to you about how we can learn uh, more and more about what fructose does and how it probably has roles in not just obesity and metabolic syndrome, but um, neurologic diseases and ADHD and bipolar disease and uh, Alzheimer's and uh, seizures and um, and GI illnesses and anaphylaxis. Uh, it really it's a, it's such a major driver. I'll throw another log on the fire. Response to COVID. Response to COVID. Yeah. No, it's a, the inflammatory response. You know, one of my friends um, did some studies on COVID and found that the hallmark is a, for long COVID syndrome is mitochondrial suppression, low ATP. And, you know, um, and this biosignature of increased glycolysis, decreased mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation is what you see with cancers but it's also what you see with fructose and it's also what you see with long-term COVID. And, um, you know, it's a very interesting observation. Well, in addition, we know that, you know, you can get COVID, but that doesn't mean you're going to die of it. Who dies of it? You know, the three demographic groups, BIPOC, right? Uh, you know, people of color, uh, obesity, and pre-existing conditions, all of which are metabolic syndrome. All right. What, do those three demographic groups share? Processed food, high sugar processed food. That's what all three share. So the question is, we now know, uh, you know, we've known this actually since 2020 when, you know, COVID hit. It's not the virus that kills you. It's the immune response to the virus that kills you, the hyper response the basically out of control immunologic response, uh, you know, the, the, basically the chain reaction basically gets out of control. You know, there are breaks on the immune response. The, the immune response is one of the few things in the body that has a positive feedback cycle. Normally, everything in the body is homeostasis, a negative feedback cycle, you know, where you get a, a stimulus and then that actually ratchets down our response to it. But the immune response is one of the places where there's a positive feedback cycle, where a little makes a lot. And the reason, of course, is you got to get rid of the infection. 
But ultimately, there has to be something to rein it in. Otherwise, it's an atomic bomb that blows up and, and you're dead. And that's basically what, you know, co the COVID immune response is, is the lack of the break on the immune response. Well, turns out if you take immune cells and you give them glucose, they do what immune cells do, which is not much. If you take immune cells like macrophages and you give them fructose, because fructose inhibits an enzyme in the immune cell called glutamine synthase, this apparently is one of the things that generates that immune response. The TNF alpha levels go sky high. The interleukin six levels go sky high. Basically, it's fructose is an immune activator. Fructose releases the break. Yeah, and the high uric acid also contributes. I think um, it may be involved in that process. We we found, for example, you know, when I was working on the wards and the COVID patients came in. The young people who died tended to have metabolic syndrome and obesity, and they, we found a relationship of uric acid, serum uric acid with morbidity and uh, poor outcomes. And, and uric acid is a reflection of the processed foods and the fructose and the metabolic syndrome. So I agree with you. There, you know, it, it, this is a, it's, it's a big animal. Fructose is a big animal that does a lot of things to a lot of systems. Uh, you know, I know you have this interest in fructose and cancer and fructose and alcoholism. And, um, and we've also linked fructose as driving the Warburg effect, for example, which is fructose is the perfect fuel for cancer cells. And fructose is, you know, is involved in alcoholism too. So, you know, we, maybe we need to have another session to, to dive in more. But um, because <laughs> it is, it's sort of scary. You know, uh, I was, when I started seeing that fructose could be involved in so many processes, I, I looked in the mirror, I said, am I tricking myself? There's, it's like too many diseases that fructose is important. And, and then, but, you know, then you do the studies and you block it or whatever. And, and it, you know, it seems like it, it, it's more like we've, di we've discovered a, 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 you know, a really important pathway. And I think the reason is, is because fructose is the only nutrient that lowers the energy in a cell. Most foods, when you eat it, you increase the ATP and the excess can go into fat. In fructose, you drop the ATP. So the energy that comes in is go to maintain energy balance goes into the fat directly. And so you maintain a low energy, a low ATP, but high fat pro, uh, program. And, and that's what people with metabolic syndrome have. That's what people with diabetes have. That's what people with Alzheimer's have, you know? And so we're looking at a signature and fructose is the artist that <laughs> signs the letter. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, all of these diseases that are, uh, you know, uh, now prevalent in our world. And, you know, I like to, you know, name them, you know, there are eight in my, in my view, uh, type two diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian disease. All of those are the components of metabolic syndrome. All of them are, uh, uh, don't have a drug treatment. All of them are going up in our society and really any society that adopted the Western diet. And all of them are due to mitochondrial dysfunction. And the problem is there's no drug that gets to the mitochondria. But there is a dietary approach that we can recommend. And, uh, you know, it's not to never eat sugar. It's just that we have to reduce it dramatically, you know. I mean, it's going to be impossible for a lot of people not to, you know, but because it's in so many foods, but very small amounts, uh, you know, the, what uh, Casey uh, Means has talked about, like uh, ways you can block the glycemic response. These are, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do to, to, uh, to make diet a healthier, you know, making healthier choices. I, I agree with that in principle, but the problem is the practice. 
okay? There's education and there's implementation. The problem that dissociates those two is a f- new, another phenomenon which we sort of did not get to, but maybe we should. It's called addiction. Yeah. I, I totally understand addiction. And, and actually, that is the great spoiler, isn't it? It is. It's, it's the thing that makes this so problematic. You know, and I do liken it to alcohol. <clears throat> because fructose and alcohol have such similar um, uh, signatures in the body and also in the brain. So 40% of Americans are teetotalers, don't touch the stuff. 40% are social drinkers, can pick up a beer, put it down, I'm in there. 10% are binge drinkers and 10% are chronic alcoholics. Now, what makes somebody a social drinker and somebody else a binge drinker or a chronic alcoholic? We still don't know. To this day, we still don't know what distinguishes those phenomena. But what we know is that you can consume a little alcohol and it be okay. But if you consume a lot of alcohol, it's not. And if you are addicted, you can't consume a little. Right, exactly. It will trigger you to eat. Yeah, it's not enough. Yeah, yeah, you're right. That's a great analogy. And so, and so this is what I see with sugar. And so the concept that we need to eat less, yes, absolutely. I totally agree. And I've been, you know, I've dedicated my retirement to trying to fix that. But, you know, addiction is the, um, you know, the obstacle. And I'll be honest with you, it's not just the obstacle for the, you know, individual you know, or for the, you know, you know, for the metabolic syndrome patient, it's an obstacle for the politicians to be able to help us with this in the same way it took so long to fix tobacco. I agree with you on that. Uh, you know, I think that if you're a, a sugarholic, uh, and many of us are, um, you know, it, you, you know, you eat that one ice cream cone and you're, it's like that, that drink after you've, uh, you know, the alcohol drink that you suddenly triggers, you know, a, a binge. So, yeah, I agree with you. We, it, it is something we have to work on. There's this really interesting finding, which is that um, uh, when we give alcohol to animals, uh, the alcohol actually triggers the polyol pathway and generates fructose. And there's now other groups too that have shown that alcohol can actually stimulate fructose production. And what happened is we've actually made, um, you know, we're making inhibitors for fructose and, uh, you know, we're still a long ways away, Robert. And, um, but, but when we do give these inhibitors, we can, it reduces the craving for sugar. And, uh, but it interesting that it also reduces the craving for alcohol. So the craving for alcohol is linked with the, with the fructose. And we're beginning to think that craving is due to ATP depletion, like in the brain, you know, like in the nucleus accumbent. Well, it actually may be, it may be ATP depletion in the tongue. So you might, you might look at uh, the work of Dr. Monica Deuce, who's a neuroscientist at U of Michigan on this. She, she, uh, this is, this is her bailiwick and, uh, she actually redid her lab to study this phenomenon, the, the, uh, the sugar phenomenon because of, you know, my work, your work, uh, et cetera. Yeah. D-U-S. That's interesting. You know, I know that if you block the taste, animals still get addicted to sugar. We did that. So we, we knocked out taste completely in the tongue. And animals will still be addicted to fructose. They won't be this um, artificial sugars, but they will be the fructose. But that they may still be getting ATP depletion in the tongue. That's a really interesting question. Wow. <laughs> well, unfortunately, from a public health standpoint, we have a long way to go. But the good news, you know, I'm wrapping up here. The good news is we have the science. Now. Turning the science into policy is always, you know, that's the alchemy of public health, you know, but we have the science. <clears throat> and, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have anything. We had calories and saturated fat. And today we have a very different paradigm. 
and your book really lays out a lot of that science metabolical and um and my my book also kind of details these fructose based pathways based on the science uh, from our group and others as well. Well, we should mention the name of your book. Nature wants us to be fat. Now I got to tell you, I don't know why anybody would want to read that one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Nature wants us to be fat, but it does provide solutions, Rob. So it does, it, it, you know, I admit that the title, you know, may, maybe it may, make you think, well, I don't really want to read that because I don't want to know more about that. But, but actually it tries to teach you like what foods are good, what foods are bad, what foods drive this switch, what foods counter the switch. I mean, one of the great powers of the, of the book is the, the, the evidence that hydration is a very powerful tool for blocking fructose effects. I mean, who would ever think that? But it turns out that water intake can can be very beneficial, and um, and that it suppresses, uh, you know, some of the mechanism by which fructose causes obesity. And we we also identified vasopressin, the hormone from the brain, is activated by fructose. And when you block the vasopressin from the uh, a specific receptor called the V1B, you can block the effects of of a metabolic syndrome and so forth from fructose. So vasopressin, which is suppressed by water, has a, a, a role in metabolic syndrome. And that's why people who are obese tend to have high vasopressin levels. Well, so let me, let me throw a different uh, line of, uh, uh, of thinking at you. Oxytocin is the safety neurotransmitter. Right. Vasopressin is the threat neurotransmitter. If we are turning our vasopressin in our brain on by sugar consumption, then we think we're constantly under threat, which of course is what we see in society today. And of course it has many, many ramifications in terms of both behavior and also continued consumption because one of the ways to assuage that threat is more consumption. So do you think, and this is sort of pie in the sky, do you think if we could get the sugar in our diet down, we could solve some of the violence we're seeing in our society today? I do think it has a role. You know, I, I, I always worry about blaming food, you know, like there is that the, the murders in uh, San Francisco 20 years ago that were linked with Twinkies, you know, the, the Twinkie defense. And, you know, I, uh, you know, so I, I don't really want to uh, completely uh, blame sh sugar for the mass shootings and so forth. But there is no doubt that fructose decreases self-control. It de increases impulsivity. And so if you happen to be a person who's quite impulsive to begin with and you're eating a lot of sugar, it may make you more impulsive. It may have a little bit less self-control, kind of like an alk a drink, you know, and then you do things that you may not normally do. But um, yeah, I think violence would decrease. My belief is violence would decrease if we could reduce sugar intake. There are in my book, I talk about it a lot. I quote lots of papers that link sugar intake and high fructose corn syrup and fructose intake with uh, violent acts. Um, but I don't want to. I don't want to go there. But I do think it's a, it's a contributor. How about that? Maybe we can convict the food companies instead. <laughs> After all, if you can convict a uh, <clears throat> a bartender for letting somebody out, you know, after too many drinks, maybe we could convict a, a soda company for, uh, you know, for supplying uh, the substrate in the first place. I'm all for it if, if, the, if the argument can be made strong, you know, uh, that it, it's, uh, it's something I hadn't thought of, but, but I do think it could be a contributor. So I, I'm going to not try to make a committed response <laughs> to you on that one, but it's a uh, very, very good thinking. Well, you know, we know that, you know, uh, the more sugar, the less attention people can pay to podcasts. So we better wrap this up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>